1962, I was still pretty young, I was near my bar mitzvah, I was in eighth grade, social studies class. In fact, we had it in the library, because I think it was so crowded, we put in a classroom. Mr. Burak, I'm sure he doesn't mind, because I'm sure he's probably deceased now. Mr. Burak, took, this is October, 1962, said, well, boys and girls, I'm not going to see you tomorrow. Well, we were naive kids in 1962, and we, all, and we already had Columbus Day holiday earlier in the month. It was, it was a holiday. It was a holiday, Mr. Burak? No, no, we're all going to be dead. This was the Cuban Missile Crisis. But the test added heat to the mounting debate over the safety of atomic tests, and came too on the eve of renewed disarmament talks between Russia and the West. This is a, a social studies teacher telling eighth graders that we're all going to die and I'm not going to see you tomorrow. And I remember that so vividly. My sister even told me the story how she was in high school. She said, I, I didn't do my homework because she figured, what's the point? But what's so amazing about this is that everyone, virtually everyone, accepted this. I mean, they didn't like it that they were all going to die in a nuclear holocaust. But the values, the myths, really, I, I would say, of the Cold War were so imbued in us, so, so, so there, that no one questioned this, that it was, it was better dead than red, as they said back then. And we sort of accepted the idea that a nuclear holocaust was possible, and no one ever even challenged what was going on. That's why these children are practicing to duck and cover, just as you do in your school. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it, just as we are ready for many other dangers that are around us all the time. And even today, the standard view of what Kennedy, President Kennedy was, you know, was, was in the office then, what he did was good. We were lucky, as it turns out. We know facts now that, that, that we were very, very lucky. It worked out okay in the end, but not because of any great genius on the part of the, uh, the American government. There were a lot of misperceptions there. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? And that, to me, was the first political event that sort of, you know, stood out for me. Uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. And I'm sure you've heard stories about that, the, the incredible impact that that had on the entire nation. You got to remember back then, uh, there weren't alternative media, really. There were, there were only three TVs, three networks. It wasn't even PBS yet. Okay. And all you could do was watch this, you know, the aftermath, you know, on the TV, hour after hour. On Sunday of that weekend, this is November 24th, 1963, the accused assassin of, of President Kennedy, Lee Harvey Oswald, was being transferred from a Dallas jail to a county jail. And this is broadcast on, on live television, and a man by the name of Jack Ruby jumped out of a crowd of reporters with a stub-nosed revolver and a point-blank range, shot him dead, live on television. Well, my mother's reaction, this is what I want to talk about, was, gee, I hope he's not Jewish. Well, indeed, he, he was, his birth name was Jacob Rubenstein, and he was actually a, 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 you know, connected to the mafia, the mob. He was a nightclub owner and what have you. But at the time, I remember that very vividly. At the time when she said, I hope he's not Jewish, I thought, oh, well, yeah, you don't want, you know, it's embarrassing, you know, for, for a Jew uh, to, be, to have done this and what have you. But I kind of realized there was more there. That I think it was a real fear she had of anti-Semitism, that Jews historically were always blamed for bad things that happened and often became victims because of that. And this is not that long after World War II. Um, polls during World War II showed, in this country, opinion polls showed that Jews were considered more objectionable than Germans and Japanese, except for the first year of the war, 1942, when it was freshest in American minds. And I think there was a lot of that. And I think it was a real fear of, of and that, that, as a kid, I didn't know from anti-Semitism. I was living in this great leave it to beaver, Jewish leave it to beaver kind of bubble where anti-Semitism was something that happened in the old country, in Europe, in Nazi Germany and so forth. But I think that's what it was. 
You know, my mother told me years later she voted for Nixon in 1960. I said, what, Mom? You voted for Nixon? And, and I think, she never explained, I think it's, it might have been because that John Kennedy was Catholic, and she rightfully or wrongly in this case, I think, associated Catholicism with anti-Semitism. But maybe even more important, and I don't know if she had the sophistication or not, the knowledge or not, John Kennedy's father, Joseph Kennedy, was a known anti-Semite. And when he was ambassador to England, he was pro-Hitler. Okay. She may have known that and just decided she would vote for Nixon because the Kennedys were quote-unquote anti-Semites. The irony, of course, was that Nixon was a classic anti-Semite. We know that because of his Watergate tapes, he's talking in the Oval Office, talking about the Jews and this and that and what have you. I always thought, found that that was ironic. I want to tell this story. 1965, okay. This would be March 4th, I think, 1965. Sunday night, watching ABC Sunday night at the movies. A big show. They put on feature films, recent feature films. And the movie that night was Judgment at Nuremberg, which is one of the first films to deal with the, the Holocaust. It was a diary of Anne Frank, but that was like, you know, Hollywood stuff. This was, this was pretty real, more realistic, and it actually included concentration camp footage in the movie. So you saw the kind of films that became more prevalent years later of the bodies and all that kind of stuff. So in the middle of this film, ABC interrupts the movie to show you a news report. Film footage. And remember back in those days, they only they had videotape, they had film. So they had to develop it before they could actually report a story with film. Okay, so the event had occurred, I think, earlier in the afternoon. This was in Selma, Alabama. It was called, it became known as Bloody Sunday. It was at the Edmund Pettus Bridge and a group of nonviolent uh, black marchers led by Congressman, now Congressman John L. John Lewis, John Lewis, was trying, trying to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge to do a march to Montgomery, Alabama for voting rights. And there were these Alabama state troopers on the other side of the bridge, and they had gas masks on. They told them to disperse, and they, and they, they just stopped. They just went into this crowd with these truncheons. They were clubbing them. There were guys on horses. It, was, it looked like the Wild West. It looked like a pogrom. That's what it looked like, really, to me. Okay, And they were attacking these people brutally. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And they showed this footage, and then they thought, okay, now we return to our feature film, Judge Andrew Amber. Now, wait a second. You're watching this movie about Nazis and persecution of minorities, and then you have this interlude where you see really what was the equivalent of American Nazis. You know, beating up on this 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 innocent minority group. Now, I don't, I won't s tell you that that's what caused massive national support for that voting rights movement, but I'm sure it was a f a factor. November of uh, 1969, November 15th, 1969, massive demonstration in Washington D.C. Uh, against the war. Uh, I remember this: the Nixon White House had three rows of school buses, three deep, around the White House so that there's no way anyone could even, he, he could see out. The story goes, this is apocryphal too, that Spiro Agnew, who was the vice president, locked his daughter in, 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 the, in the bathroom because she wanted to go to the demonstration. I was supposed to be a marshal for this demonstration. This, these are the compromises you make. But you had to go down a week earlier, and I had midterms. So what do you do? So I took the midterms. I decided I'll just go to the demonstration. My roommate and I uh, took a chartered bus going down from Philadelphia to Washington. It was like going 25 miles an hour. It was sputtering. It was obviously having mechanical difficulties. And I said, we got to get off this bus. So we get off the bus some, somewhere, I think in, maybe in Maryland. And we put out our thumbs. It was 95, I guess, or say 95. Immediately, immediately, a car comes zooming over three lanes. A nice couple from New Jersey. They had picnic lunch. They were going to the demonstration, too. They brought us in. It was, a, it was like this wonderful sense of camaraderie. This demonstration was huge. It wasn't just young people, you know. It was black, white, old, young. It was incredible. Um, it was a sea of humanity. Uh, I remember it, we were all you know, near the Washington Monument, and... Um, 
who was it? Okay, oh, Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger, the great folk singer, still alive, bless him. Okay, was leading a huge chant of, of John Lennon's song. All we are saying is give peace a chance. Everyone was, the art, it was a beautiful. And then Dr. Benjamin Spock, the famous pediatrician who had become a, a very noted uh, uh, anti-war uh, radical, announced that the Associated Press has just announced there are a million people here. They were exaggerating. It, it was maybe like 500, still the biggest that they'd ever seen at that point, about 500,000, I'm guessing. Okay, still, you could, you could easily confuse that with a million. Okay, and at that point, Peter, Paul, and Mary broke into If I Had a Hammer. There's this wonderful sense of, you know, exhilaration. Although I'm not sure what it did to stop the war as, as to demonstrate that, that Nixon had certainly no, had, a, had to. Okay. Now, remember, my bus broke down. So it's the end of the day. So how do you get back to Philadelphia? Well, the train. So we're walking down. I don't know. Even today, Washington confuses the hell out of me. I, every street looks the same to me. Walking down, you know, the street here towards, I think, Pennsylvania Station. And I see this um, group of people in the street, blocking the street. So I said, well, I'll just walk around. The group of people continue. So I walk around the group of people. And all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of the street. There's this group of protesters behind me. And in front of me, maybe 50 yards away, are all these helmeted policemen with gas masks on and their clubs up like this. And I go, oh, shit. I'm literally right in the, I'm the only part in the middle of the street. It was, I was outside the Justice Department, and I got over to the side, fortunately, at that point. And also, I'm looking at the, the American flag comes down the Justice Department, and a Viet Cong flag goes up. Almost as quickly, the Viet Cong flag comes down, the American flag goes up. I, I, think, I, I think I heard some window breaking. I'm not sure if I heard that. And they were young, free Bobby Seal. Bobby Seal was a Black Panther leader, okay, who, God, he was arrested so many times, I, I can't even tell you what he was being charged with maybe at this point, okay. And this was a radical faction, I think, of, of SDS who was out there. So, so my roommate and I, we got out of that area, but all the streets were like blocked off. You know, it was like, you know, the streets in Washington are kind of like, they all meet in weird ways. I remember going to a policeman saying, you know, you know can you tell me how to get to, to, to Pennsylvania Station? And he, and he went, no, 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 he gas face, no, 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 no. And I said, I don't want motivated me to do this. Excuse me, sir, I cannot understand you with that contraption on your face. <laughs> I don't know why I was being that brazen. Okay, but finally, we were, we were about a block away, and this is when the police, I didn't see it, began lobbing what they called pepper fog. Today they have pepper spray, which you've seen, which is like a canister, you know, spray people. They didn't have that. They, they hadn't perfected that yet. It was pepper fog, which was canisters, which they would lob. And of course, it was a, it was a fall day. It was windy. And so this stuff began to spread way beyond that immediate crowd. I mean, it was a horrible, burning sensation. It's terrible. And then we got to the, tr and, and, and my roommate, who was a nice Jewish boy from, from upstate New York, okay, he was studying theater, okay. He wasn't very political, but he was political enough to come to the protest with me. I remember him saying, those fascists, they're, he was, he was, he was spouting all the, um, the, the, the rhetoric, if you will. Of the air. Remember the train ride back, back home, it was all crowded. It looked like a scene like from, Doc, I don't know if you saw the movie, Dr. Zhivago, uh, where, where they're all in the crowded train and whatever. So they were all crowded train. We looked like, we looked like war refugees because people had like, like their eyebrows and their hair was caked with, I guess, the residue. Okay. <laughs> so I get home. I remember my mother, my mother, bless her, was very supportive of this. She was, she was concerned about my safety, but she didn't say you shouldn't do this or whatever. I, and I'm just such a devilish guy. I, I called her up on the phone. I said, hello, uh, Mrs. Gerstein. This is the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Okay, and she right away, she knew, is that you, Mark? And I said, yeah, I told her well, what had happened. And she said, go into a shower. Stay in a shower for 24 hours. You know, it's a very typical, I love the Jewish mother response to all this and what happened.